of you know me, for those of you that do not, my name is Marissa Blackburn and I'm the Environmental Education Manager with Cape Fear River Watch and I coordinate our first Saturday seminar series. And so I always start by giving some updates and reminders for Cape Fear River Watch events and upcoming programs, so I will do just that. Um, next Saturday we have our second Saturday cleanup. It will be in the Smith Creek watershed at the intersection of Princess Place Drive and Evan Street. So you can reach out um, to, you can register online or reach out to Rob if you have any questions about that. Um, the following Saturday, we have our third Saturday paddle. It's going to be on Town Creek. The put-in is at the Brunswick County Nature Park. Um, it's going to be with Car Kayak Carolina because our Riverkeeper Camp is on vacation right now. So um, it will be a different but very fun paddle. Um, on Sunday, um, November 5th, from 4 to 6 p.m., we're going to be having our annual membership meeting here in our office. Um, so you can come to um, learn about all of the great things we've done this year, all the things we have coming up, um, and mingle with fellow River Watchers. Um, and then on Sunday, November 11th, we have our big fundraiser for the year, our Fall Fest fundraiser. Um, huh? S sorry, what did I say? November 12th. No November 12th. November is the 11th month of the year, so I have 11 on my paper, the 12th. Um, and it will be from 12 to 4 p.m. at Waterline Brewing right down the street. Um, and we're going to have raffles. We have a, an online auction that's actually live right now. Um, we'll have good beer. One dollar for every beer is going to get um, donated to the River Watch and good people. So we invite you to come out to that. And I'm going to share some of the awesome online raffle items that we have available so that you can get excited about those things and bid on them today. <laughs> um, can you sh get the lights for me, Dana? Thank you. So these are the details for our Fall Fest. going to be on November 12th. We're going to have music there um, and then all the other things that I mentioned. Right now we have on our online auction, um, that's a QR code to scan to go there. You can pull out a phone and do that now or I'm going to pass this around as well if you guys would like to see details on that. Um, some of our items that we have that we're raffling off is going to be a two-hour patrol flight with Kemp um, of the Cape Fear River Basin. We have a sailing charter with the Wilmington Sailing Company. We have a new paddle board, which is right above you all here hanging on our wall. A beautiful paddle board. So for yourself or the holidays are coming up, a great gift for friends and family. Um, we have a half-day fishing charter with Captain John Huff. We have a four-hour fishing trip with Captain John Owens. Um, we also have a um, boat trip with our Riverkeeper Camp. Um, and then we have a camp package as well with a camp kitchen and a $250 gift card to Great Outdoor Provision Company. So we're adding more items as well. We also have in the back, Dana, my Vanna White is showing you all this bike, this lovely beach cruiser that we also have available if you want it, want it or know anyone that might. All right. Well, those are my updates about upcoming events for you all. Um, a quick reminder, we do have our donation jar here. I'm going to put it in the, in the front room with all the pancakes if on your way out you feel generous, you'd like to donate for our seminar today so that we're able to continue to provide free pancake breakfasts and seminars throughout the year. And then one other quick update, um, we will not be having a daffodil sale this year, maybe next year. Um, that's just a quick update. In the past we have done daffodil sales, but we will not be doing that. All right. I'm excited to introduce our speaker today, who I had the pleasure of working with for over two years at the Bald Head Island Conservancy. Um, Dr. Beth Darrow is a coastal ecologist who specializes in water quality and plant-animal interactions of estuaries. As part of her PhD research, Beth used ancient oyster shells from Native American shell middens to examine watershed nitrogen inputs to estuaries and how this compares to modern times. Since then, she has worked with the oyster aquaculture industry in North Carolina and in coastal reserves. In her current role as chief scientist at Bald Head Island Conservancy, she has begun a series of oyster reef restoration sites and works closely with the village of Bald Head Island and other nonprofits to implement these projects. And I'm going to turn it over to her. Here? No. Thank you, Marissa. Is this working? Are we good for sound and everything? Okay, cool. Thank you so much for coming out today. It's so nice to see so many eager faces on a Saturday morning. I think the pancakes helped. They were delicious. It's a great idea. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to talk to you today, today about oysters. I don't know if you all knew, but this is North Carolina Oyster Month. So happy Oyster Month, everybody. October is Oyster Month. 
Um, we used to celebrate Oyster Week, but there were so many events throughout the state that a bunch of us kind of decided that, you know what, we need to expand and take over the whole month. So um, you'll probably see and hear about a lot of oyster things happening this month. So if it's something that interests you, you know, check online and see what's going on. The Coastal Fed is involved with a lot of things. Um, and there's a, a new uh, conglomeration of organizations called the Oyster Trail, North Carolina Oyster Trail. And look them up if you're interested in oysters and tasting oysters. It's the start of oyster harvest season. And there's just, you know, a lot of fun stuff going on. So I'm going to focus today on shells, oyster shells. Um, but I'm always happy to chat about anything oyster so we can talk more about, you know, any other oyster related questions you may have or any other questions in general. I love talking about nature and, and everything. Um, but yeah, I work at Bald Head Island Conservancy. We're a small island in um, South Brunswick County. We're actually the southeasternmost point in the state of North Carolina. If you have not been out to Bald Head Island, it, I really recommend it. It's really beautiful. It can be logistically challenging because there's a ferry involved. So if you need some advice on how to get there and how to plan your trip, I'm also happy to help with that. Um, so if you're eating your delicious oysters this month, I'm sorry that we don't have any today to have with your pancakes. Um, but there's always a shell left over, right? You, you, you're not going to eat this shell. So I have a question for you guys. When you're done with eating those delicious oysters, what should you do with those oyster shells? A, throw them in the garbage. B, let your restaurant throw them in the garbage. C, take them to a shell recycling center or ask your restaurant if they do so. D, make a driveway from them. E, throw them in the marsh. <laughs> okay, what do we want to vote for? Okay, A, B, C. Oh, you guys are so smart. <laughs> D, I mean, some of us may have done this, you know? Make crafts from them, you know? Or E, throw them in the marsh. All right, you guys are so smart. All right. So yeah, we want to take them to a shell recycling center. These are an amazing, an amazing resource. I'm, I'm holding these because these are the only ones that I had at my house, and I'll pass these around. These are tiny uh, baby oyster shells, and I'll pass those around. Um, so. Oyster shells are an amazing resource. I hope that I will convince you of that today. And they shouldn't just be thrown in the trash. It is actually illegal to throw them in the landfill in North Carolina. Not very many people knew that. But there is actually an ordinance about it. So you should take them to a recycling center. You should ask your restaurant to recycle them or work with other organizations who do so. Because it can be used for many things. Yes, sir? I know a lot of people are probably like, well, if I just throw it in the marsh, yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the reasoning for just general people? Yeah, that? that's a great question. So he asked, why wouldn't I just throw them in the marsh? Because that's taking it back to nature. Um, I would say that would be the second choice. If you don't have a shell recycling center around and you need a place to get rid of them, I think that that would be an OK choice. The thing is that when they're in the marsh, if you just throw them in the marsh, it may not actually be a good place for oysters to grow. So we'll talk about where oysters have very specific conditions that they need to grow on shells. And when we take it to a recycling center, we take it to a place where they're actually going to use those for a project. So they're going to make an oyster reef. They're going to build them. And it's going to go into a place where they know that oysters can actually survive. Yeah. I thought it was also, if you do them directly into the marsh, it can introduce bacteria. And they need to cure for at least six months on land. Yeah. That's another really good point. So we want to make sure that those shells don't have any associated bacteria or pests or parasites, especially if those oysters came from a different geographic area. We could be spreading things around. So ideally, we're not like eating it fresh and then throwing it directly into the marsh. So they cure first. Right, they cure, they call it. Yes, sir? Where might there be a recycling center? I have a list of them at the end. <laughs> so you got to wait till then. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about Bald Head Island. Here's a picture of beautiful Bald Head Island. Have any of you been to Bald Head Island before? Have you? Oh, wow, all right. Um, so like I said, we're at the, the tip of the Cape Fear Peninsula, at, right at the mouth of the Cape Fear River. And basically, you know, we're interested in the Cape Fear River and Cape Fear River Watch because we're receiving everything that y'all are putting into the water up here. Um, so, you know, we have an um, interest in that. So here's the Cape Fear River here. 
And this is actually what they call the point of Cape Fear. So the shoals extend all the way down 40 miles off of the Cape Fear Peninsula. This is called Frying Pan Shoals. You may have heard of the Frying Pan Light Tower. It's all the way down here. And this is this scary area where there would be lots of shipwrecks and pirates and things like that that got it, the name Cape Fear. Um, so we have a small nonprofit organization. We, um, our mission is to discover, learn, conserve, and preserve. We're very focused on Bald Head Island, but other bear islands in general. And we have an environmental education department, which Marissa used to lead. And then I lead our conservation science and research partnerships. And we also have a land preservation component where we try to preserve parcels of land for perpetuity, for conservation. So today I want to convince you of a couple things with oyster shells. I'll say that oysters are nature's alchemists. We'll talk what it, about what an alchemist is. Um, the oysters helped humans survive and thrive in North, Car North America and North Carolina, so they're really important. And that oysters and oyster shells can help coastal towns like ours face the future. Those are the, my main take home messages. And I'm sure a lot of you probably know what an oyster is but we're talking about one species of oyster primarily in eastern North Carolina. This is the eastern oyster, Crassostria virginica. Um, it's a bivalve mollusk, that means it has two shells, um, and it lives in brackish and saltwater environments. So no fresh water, but it's actually pretty resilient to a wide range of salinities. You, they're very commonly seen in marshes, such as this. And we call them a keystone species. A keystone meaning that they are part of what holds a whole ecosystem together. So, and that's because they have so many different ecological functions, and we'll get into what those are. Um, they filter the water column, so they're filter feeders, they're consuming plankton from the water. They are supporting fisheries by providing habitat, um, and also just by being a food source to us and to higher trophic levels. Real quick, I wanted to get into a little bit of oyster biology because not everybody realizes that this shell actually starts with a planktonic, tiny planktonic larvae. When I say planktonic, it means it's floating in the water column. So the eggs and sperm are released into the water and that's where they join together and there are all these tiny little baby oysters floating around in the water column and they'll do that for about a week until they develop a tiny little foot you can see that little foot. It actually looks like a foot in that picture. <laughs> and then they, set, they settle on a hard substrate. So there are really key, and scientists are still trying to investigate what are the, um, the cues that cause oyster larvae to know that now's the right time, now's the right place, that I'm gonna come out of the water column and I'm gonna find the place to settle. And then they cement themselves to that hard substrate and then that's where they live the rest of their lives. Once they've settled there, they cannot move. They cement themselves. So um, the small baby oysters, like that one I passed around, are called spat. And that's usually when they're kind of got a flattened shell. And then they grow up to be our, the oysters that we know and love. Um, the harvestable size oysters, about three inches long, in North Carolina usually take about a year to grow that size but oysters can live up to 20 years. If they don't get eaten or you know, harvested, they can, they can live pretty long. Um, but what's really cool about this whole process is that they're creating a reef. So just like a coral reef, this is a substrate, a habitat, where lots of other organisms like to live and grow. There are lots of really cool nooks and crannies where larval fish and crabs and worms and all kinds of critters will live. And that also com creates a complex structure which helps create a natural breakwater. So we're protecting the shoreline, we're reducing erosion, we are slowing down the currents of water as um, waves crash, and um, also those, those oysters are filtering the water and cleaning the water while they're there. So we like oysters for all those reasons. But I want to focus a little more on their shells that magical shell, oh sorry, is there a question? One question. Yeah. yeah. Are they big enough to see uh, with the naked eye before they set, like floating around? Not really, so you would need a microscope, okay. yeah. And when did they start to grow a shell? Because I thought they have to attach to an existing something. Yeah, so they have a, like a fake shell, like a tiny shell at the villager stage, you can kind of see at the top there. Is it hard already? 
it's, it's probably flimsy, I would say. Um, but it, they're starting to create that calcium carbonate shell at that villager stage. So they have a little bit of a shell, but they still can swim because they have a little cilia. Okay. And then when they get their foot, that, that is the shell there. And when they get the foot, then they can cement themselves, but they just kind of have that one shell and then they don't become 3D until probably a few weeks later, 3D. One shell meaning what we think of as a half shell? What's that? When you say they just have that one they, shell. They have two shells, but it appears flat to us. Yeah. Yeah. How big is that? A few millimeters. Okay. Yeah. Now, do they naturally gravitate to a hard surface, or are they just settling on any surface? That's a great question. Would you like to start a PhD program? <laughs> because that is something, and that is something that's being investigated right now. So, um, some studies have shown that there's some kind of scent cue in the water. There's something that they smell, like a chemical, that they're like, "Oh, this might be a good place. Time to go down." Um, and then some show that there, if there's a sound cue, so they're a little like snapping shrimp and the oyster is moving around, that there's some kind of vibration that then they go, "Okay, now it's time to go down." So it could be that they randomly, but it could also be that they get to a point where they're like, either I try to settle or I'm going to die, so I need to, I need to go down. Um, but it's unknown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, they need to spend a part of their time in, in water. So they have to be exposed to air uh, to, you know, partially. They do not. Water. Yeah, so they do not need to be exposed to air. There are some completely subtidal reefs. Subtidal means that they're never exposed by the tide. And then there are some intertidal reefs. And we have more intertidal reefs here in, North, in south, southeastern North Carolina, so that's what we're more used to seeing. But like in Pamlico Sound, for example, there are huge oyster reefs that never see the light of day. Okay, we're going to let her finish her presentation. <laughs> <laughs> or any more questions? Because, you know, she's tired. In interest of time. <laughs> Thanks, cool. everybody. It's awesome to have conversations. I love it. Let yeah. All right, so getting into shells. How are shells made? And, and what's cool about shells is that they're actually, instead of t like spinning you know, straw into gold or something, they're actually turning excess nutrients into food. They're um, turning that into a really sustainable source of protein. There have been studies that have shown that um, oysters actually are the, the least, they emit the least amount of greenhouse gases of any protein source, including vegetarian protein sources, because they don't require any external inputs to grow. They're eating nutrients and plankton from the water column, turning that into protein that we can eat. Um, they can all, they're turning carbon dioxide into those oyster shells, which is then a useful substrate. Um, they're forming pearls, which is something that we can talk a little bit about. And they're a renewable, recyclable resource. How is this done? So a little bit of biochemistry. Um, so this is a side view of the oyster shell. And I'm going to pass around. Um, these are really fragile, so please be careful. But these are cross sections of oyster shells. And you can look at how the layers are formed. Um, this is really magnified, so we can't see this with our naked eye. But basically, that calcium carbonate forms different layers. We have calcite. We have aragonite. We have an organic matrix, which comes from the food. And then we have folia. And, and this makes it really strong, because there are all these different layers that are like bricks and mortar that work together. How is this done? So there's a lot of carbonate in seawater. It's just something that's there a lot, just kind of floating around. There's also a lot of calcium in seawater. It's just a natural ion that's out there. So this is another cross-section where we have the water, we have the oyster tissue, we have a calcifying space, which is like a microscopic area between the tissue and the shell. And basically, they're taking all these ions, they're allowing them to just diffuse into this calcifying space. And it actually precipitates a mineral without the input of energy for this part of the process. Where energy is required is actually to pump hydrogen out of the calcifying space. So hydrogen comes from, you know, you think about like acidity, pH. They have to pump that hydrogen out to allow that calcium carbonate to form. And this is important to know because when we think about ocean acidification, 
and increases in CO2, that actually also increases the amount of hydrogen ions that calcifying organisms have to pump out in order to calcify. So that includes coral reefs, that includes clams, that includes anything that has that hard structure is gonna have this problem where it takes more energy the more hydrogen ions there are to calcify. Does that make sense? So let's talk about pearls a little bit. How do pearls form? Has anyone seen a natural pearl in an Eastern oyster? Yeah. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of you have. They're, do you think they're pretty? <laughs> so a lot of people are surprised. I've actually, I've opened thousands of oysters in my career and I've worked with a lot of students and they're like, doo, 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 doo. whoa, what is this weird bumpy thing? Maybe one out of every few hundred that you open might have this weird bumpy thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you found a pearl, whoa. And I'm like, oh, can I sell it? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, you can make a necklace if you want. But basically how this forms is through that calcification process, sometimes something gets stuck in there. So it's just a little bit of an irritant like a grain of sand or a particle that then that calcium carbonate actually forms like a protective scar kind of around it and that creates a pearl and the people that you know create pearls and have pearl oysters do that on purpose they'll put a little seed of something in there and then get it to form pearls and then they'll harvest those oysters for that um, another really cool thing is that that cement that those baby oysters use to attach to their hard substrate is an incredibly, incredibly strong cement. It's a polymer that biochemists are investigating for use in things like surgical applications because it's a completely waterproof adhesive. So it's pretty cool that you know, they can investigate PFAS? this. Huh? Natural PFAS? No PFAS. <laughs> it's an adhesive, it's waterproof, and sticks really well, and it's natural. So pretty cool. And then just to get a little bit into the research that Marissa mentioned that I did many years ago, um, what I think is super cool about oyster shells is that they're also a natural recorder of environmental conditions. So Marissa had some of these, which you may have, you may be aware that our trees and our tree rings record environmental conditions, right? So we can count how many years old this tree is. We can go back and look and see what the growth rate was based on how far away, how far apart those tree rings are. We can look back and be like, whoa, what's this dark area here? What happened during that time? And we can also measure the chemical composition of these different areas to tell us something about climate conditions um, and what was going on in the environment. And you may have also heard of like ice cores, right? That People will take an ice core, they'll extract the CO2 and the different chemicals, and they'll say, this is what the climate was tens of thousands of years ago. So you can actually do the same with oyster shells. So those shells that I'm passing around, the reason that I cut them like that was that I wanted to take tiny microscopic needle pricks along that ridge and create a graph that looks something like this, where we're going along the edge of that shell and each little ridge is a year or a period of time. And then we can measure the chemical composition, the isotopic composition, and it tells us something about either the temperature or the salinity or the types of nitrogen that were in the water column through time. And what I did for my work was I compared that to modern shells to be able to see, okay, how were things back before colonial settlement? This was in the Gulf Coast, Mississippi and how are things now, and how can we compare? But we can also tell things like, all right, so Native American people collected these oysters. There's a seasonal pattern happening here. Oh, it looks like they always were harvested at a certain time of year based on the temperature. So it can tell something about how the people were living and how they were using them as well. So lots of really cool things. Here's a shell midden in Graham Bay, Mississippi. That's where I did my work. So a shell midden is basically a, um, a pile <laughs> of shells. I mean, they're all types of middens. They're kitchen middens you may have heard of, like Jamestown and stuff, where people throw their trash. So to the people living here at that time, we don't know the purpose. It might have been a big trash pile. It might have been like an oyster roasting site. In some cases, they're ceremonial sites where they'll actually build rings or they'll actually build houses or like the chief's house, 
house would be on top of it. Um, but what's cool about it is that all these shells in this spot have created their own environment. So these trees are able to grow. Um, it creates a more alkaline soil. Um, and I got to work with archaeologists who were looking for things like pottery shards and arrowheads. And then they had all these extra oyster shells. And they're like, I don't know, what do you want to do with these? I'm like, I'll take them. <laughs> so what did we learn? Um, we've learned through time that Basically, Native Americans sustainably harvested oysters. We don't know if they knew for sure what they were doing, but basically they would go to a place, they would harvest oysters, they would use them, and then they would probably move on to a different spot. And we know this because the oyster size did not change through time. So it's not like they were taking all the large oysters and only leaving the small ones behind. Um, and we also know that the Native American settlements did not change or alter the nitrogen inputs to estuaries in the way that many post-colonial places have. So my study actually showed that on the Gulf Coast there had not been major changes. It's still a pretty, this area is still fairly undeveloped. Um, there aren't a whole lot of nitrogen inputs to this particular estuary, but a colleague of mine worked in Chesapeake Bay and found that there had been major shifts in nitrogen inputs through time compared to Native American times using these oyster shells. Um, I also got to work, and here are some cool things that are found that are made from oyster shells. So Native Americans were using them for um, tempering their pottery, for making masks, for making pins, and different decorations and jewelry and things like that. These are all from North Carolina. Um, but this led into another project where I was really excited to get to work with some oyster shells from Manhattan. And I don't know, if you're all interested in oysters and the history of oysters at all, I highly recommend this book called The Big Oyster by Mark Kurlansky. And he says things like, Benjamin Franklin made a comment about eating an oyster as big as a baby. <laughs> and, like, and like, who was the first person who ever thought that it was a good idea to eat an oyster? And, um, and he talks about what a big business it was in Manhattan. Um, in fact, you may have visited downtown and near Wall Street is Pearl Street. And the reason why it's called Pearl Street is that it was paved from oyster shells. There were so many oysters being brought into New York Harbor that they were just tossing them out on the, sh on the street and they were using those shells to pave the roads. Does anyone recognize this street paved with oyster shells? Or have an idea where it might be? Somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is Wrightsville Avenue. So paved with oyster shells. I think this is the 1930s. So here in North Carolina, oh, actually, before I, I want to go back to Manhattan, actually, because what I was saying was I was excited because um, there was another museum that was throwing away oyster shells. So in Manhattan, whenever they do a new foundation for a city block, they do an archaeological excavation, and they look for you know, any important things. And they had boxes and boxes and boxes of oyster shells. And they're like, we're going to throw these out unless someone wants them for something. <laughs> I'm like, yes, please. So um, anyway, this is a shell that was taken from the Stadthuis, which is, that, this is during the Dutch times of colonial sediment in Manhattan. And this was taken from a minnen that they think came from um, outside a tavern. So this is a little shell that I was able to sample and see if there had been changes in Manhattan back then compared to now. And um, I had shells from seven, 1600s all the way through 1900s. And through that time, there was actually no change. So um, we, we need to do a modern comparison, too. But. So yeah, so here in North Carolina, um, oysters were a really important subsistence resource at first you know, to people that settlers that moved here. Um, people were mostly oyster tonging. There were no mechanical methods for harvesting oysters. Um, they were really popular. You could find them on any street corner in Wilmington or New Bern. And usually the fishermen from the Outer Banks would use them for bartering. And they would try to sell them inland as much as they could, but they were somewhat limited because of being able to keep them fresh. So you weren't going to see oysters really moving further inland until we got the railroad. 
Once we got a railroad, then it was big business. Big business. Um, and then also steam canneries were invented kind of at the last part of the 1800s. And then there's just like all out, yeah, every man for himself were dredging. Um, there are shucking houses everywhere. It's like a 15 year period oyster boom in the late 1800s. Um, that's when all these shell roads were being created too because there are huge mountains of shells that were being used. Um, people also would harvest from those shell middens, the Native American shell middens. A lot of them are gone now because people would use those for, uh, for roads. And there were three cents a bushel in the early 1900s. But what I want to make the case is that the oyster shells, it wasn't just eating the oysters, but the shells themselves helped people thrive. So these shells are used for, you may have heard of lime, right? Lime cement um, is made from oyster shells and whitewash is made from oyster shells. So Brunswick Town, Fort Johnston, and even Old Baldy, or lighthouse on Baldhead Island, all were painted on the outside with lime that was made from oyster shells. It was used for fertilizer, um, and people would feed it to their chickens. There's a study that I read about how the 1920s, it was really important for women to have chickens, and they would um, you know, have eggs, and then that was their egg money. So women, that was kind of their own little industry, their own money that they could use to be a little more independent. Um, but basically what started happening was over-harvest of the resource, and this led to the oyster wars, which I'm not really going to get into, but basically we had people coming from outside of North Carolina trying to harvest our resources. Apparently there were some gunfights over oyster beds, which sounds pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rules were changed so that you could only go back to hand tonging. So nowadays, the oysters are actually listed as a species of concern by the state. Um, we are in a period where we're trying to enhance the oyster population so that we still have a good food resource. Um, there are a bunch of different types of methods for doing that. And one is to encourage the oyster aquaculture industry so that we're eating a renewable resource as opposed to going and harvesting from the wild beds. We're still allowed to harvest from the wild, wild beds, but there are a lot more regulations now than there used to be. But I wanted to make the point that those oyster shells, back to those shells, one of the problems is that um, the oyster larvae that are in the water column need a place to settle, and all those shells that were taken out, those mounds of shells, those roads that were created, all that substrate is now missing from our waterways. So we need to try to get that back into those waterways in a good, sustainable way in order to help rebuild these populations. There are a lot of benefits of having oyster reefs out there, whether they're wild reefs or restored reefs. They can still act as that filtration capacity. They can still help um, protect shorelines. This is really important in the face of climate change and sea level rise that we try to build natural solutions to protect our waterways. You may have heard of the Billion Oyster Project back to New York. So the goal of this organization is to get a billion oysters back into New York Harbor. And they're on their way. So they're building lots of restored oyster reefs. Prince William was just there like two weeks ago. Pretty excited. He's out there in his waders checking it out. Um, so they're doing a great job up in New York. And they're trying to get them all out there so that they, they can filter the water column. Um, they're not necessarily going to harvest these oysters because it's still pretty dirty out there, but they're going to enhance those natural populations. And here in North Carolina, we have lots of preservation efforts too. So a lot of oyster sanctuaries are in Pamlico Sound. That's where a lot of our wild native large reefs were. And they will create sanctuaries where you're not allowed to harvest. Um, they also are putting a lot of cult, which is just like um, broken up oyster shells. They'll put big mounds of colch out there in Pamlico Sound and they have these really big operations with you know, dredges and um, bulldozers and things like that to get all that shell out there so that then oysters can come back and settle and make big populations. And a big part of that is that oyster shell recycling. In order to have those shells, you got to get them from somewhere. So creating programs with restaurants to get them to recycle shells is, is probably the best way to go. Individuals too. Um, and then as I mentioned, there's also an effort to shift the focus to aquaculture, get growers making 
um, getting these aquaculture oysters out there so that they're not harvesting the wild resource. And a lot of this, most of this, is led by the Coastal Federation, who does a great job with all the oyster stuff in the state with partners. So as I mentioned, restoring oysters, it's seeking to reverse this damage. There are a number of different methods that can be used. At the top here are reef balls, so that's one way that some places choose to use um, that hard substrate. If you don't have enough shells, you can actually put concrete structures out there and the oysters will settle on those as well. Or you could do shell bags, so getting a bag of shells and then the oysters will start settling on those bags. Um, and then creating things like a living shoreline. Sometimes there are plantings that are put behind it as well, so planting the grass so that the whole system is restored. On Bald Head Island, we have been experimenting with using the shell bag method. So we've been collecting oyster shells for a number of years, putting them in shell bags. It's a very unique place to work where we have to, we didn't have bulldozers, we have to take them out to the oyster reefs with kayaks. So we have three different sites that we've created. They have um, about 100, over 100 bags per site. They're not the biggest sites in the world compared to others that you might see around here. But we were able to get um, donations of shells from some different restaurants on Baldhead Island and in Southport. And then we had some volunteers that really helped us out with creating those shell bags and help, helping getting them out into the marsh. And it's been pretty cool because that was done um, two years ago now. So we've had some interns who have um, done some studies and we wanted to track the progress of these oyster reefs. So we have wild reefs that we compare them to and then we have some uh, just control like muddy sites that we compare them to. And we look at how much, how many oysters are actually growing there and how the habitat has changed. This is Cade, one of our interns from last year. And he found that after one year, our, um, our restored reefs were already collecting and attracting oysters. So those restored reefs are the blue bars. And you can see that they have almost as many um, live oysters as the wild reefs. So that's just after one year. In terms of habitat, we found all kinds of critters in these restored oyster reefs. Polychaetes, which are worms, barnacles, mussels, crabs, different kinds of crabs, snails. And again, you can see the blue that we have lots of different kinds of critters in the restored reefs and almost as many or more as the wild reefs. So they're providing habitat. So we're pretty happy with how those have gone. Um, there are some pros and cons to using those shell bags. One of them is that they're plastic. It's like a plastic mesh. So the thing that we're looking into for our next project is a, it's a, a biodegradable product. We're working with Sandbar Oyster Company, and they're using these oyster catcher substrate, and we're gonna create a new, we call it a demonstration site, because it's gonna be in a really visible location near the Bald Head Island Marina. And um, basically you put out this, it's like paper mache, <laughs> I would say. Paper mache on burlap type thing and they can make all kinds of different structures from it. So here's an example of what it looks like when it's put out, and this is after just one, more, one year at Pine Mill Shores. It's um, attracted a lot of oysters, and eventually that structure in the interior will biodegrade. So that is what we're planning for this site over here, and we, um, we have cost share from the Coastal Fed, so it's been a really cool collaboration, and we we're planning to get that out there in January 2024. So next week, our interns are doing pre-sampling to be able to see what the changes are after we put this new site in. So what can you do to help um, install living shorelines? If there, there are reef builds all the time, if you look at the Coastal Fed, they host things a lot. Um, do you guys host reef builds at all? I don't know if you get involved with those. But um, it's a really fun way to get out there, especially this time of year and when it's nice out and just, you know, get some the muscle power in. And then here are some locations nearby where you can recycle those oyster shells. So um, at the Coastal Feds office on Wrightsville Beach, they have containers there. I'm sure there's some restaurants around here that do as well that you could probably drop them off at. Um, but you can also just take them to the landfill and they have a special 
oyster shell recycling area. Early gardens? Oh, cool. Great. That's a good tip. Oh, nice. Great. So you have no excuse. Atlantic Seafood in Hampstead. Atlantic Seafood in Hampstead? Nice. What's that? I don't know. Cool. Yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, so, and then you can always, you know, when you're eating oysters, I encourage people to ask for local oysters. Ask where oysters come from. It's supporting the local, local industry. Um, support local oyster growers. If you can ask, like, hey, are these aquacultured oysters? When, it, when it's aquacultured, it, they're grown out in the water column. They're not, it's not like fish farming where they're grown in a little tank, and we can talk about that. But um, it's really supporting local industry. A lot of these are families that are fisher families that um, are now transitioning to oyster aquaculture, and it's really cool to see um, how the industry is taking off. Check out the North Carolina Oyster Trail. Volunteer with your local organizations. And if you would like, you can adopt an oyster through the Conservancy's website. We are, you can leave a little message and we will write your message on there, the name of your loved one, and we'll put it out on our reef. So, <laughs> just 10 bucks. <laughs> and that, that supports our, uh, our efforts, which are not really funded. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to our interns and staff, volunteers. It's a team effort. Do you have any questions? Yes, Dana. So, do you know, can you describe how they create the little polymer, the polymer foot? Um, so the foot is, hmm, no, I can't. It's, mu <laughs> it's from the mucus. So it's basically, some of it is protein and some of it is carbohydrate. And it, I mean, that was the thing that's, that's, that's a separate thing, the foot, and then they have a So the foot is the physical, like, appendage, like organ. The up. mucus is the polymer that then is secreted to stick themselves to the substrate. Yeah. From the foot. Like, you know, a slimy snail has this slime. It's this slime. But I don't really, really know how it's biochemically created. Yeah. So uh, the eastern oyster, is that the only Yeah, for the most part. Yes, so, yes. So when people like, mm -hmm. when I bought oysters, they'll say like Parker's Island or this place or that place. Is that yep, that's just the location where it was, it where it came flavor. from. Yeah, okay. which can change the flavor. So you may have heard of like, I love this. It's, um, you know, like vinic when you um, get your wines from certain regions, mm -hmm. so like the grapes are the Chardonnay or the this or the whatever. They say that the same is true for oysters because they're consuming the, the food from the water column have a certain salinity, kind of brininess, flavor that reflects where it came from. But they're all still the same. But they're all the same species. Yeah. Well, ours are like Teflon flavored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. From your analysis of uh, uh, changes, evidence of uh, environmental change uh, to the analysis of the oyster shell over centuries, what have you seen about the local area? Here in North Carolina? Yeah. So I did not do it here in North Carolina, unfortunately. Mississippi. Yeah, so my PhD work was in Mississippi, and there are not very many shell middens in this area. Unfortunately, the Native Americans from this area were mostly wiped out with very, very early European colonization. So we don't have the best records of Native American settlement from like the Cape Fear region. Um, there are some middens in different areas, like I think Cape Hatteras and um, the Outer Banks and places like that, but I have not sampled from those places. So I cannot answer that. Yes? So I've been, I work with Coastal Federation. I've been trying to educate people that I meet about the importance of it and how, you know, the filtering the water and mm -hmm. having cleaner water. And the question I always get, and I don't have a very, I don't have the best answer yet for them, but they say, so they're taking all these toxins and pesticides and all this stuff mm -hmm. to filter, so when I eat an oyster, is that what I'm eating? Now, and mm -hmm. I understand some of what they're, they're using as their nutrients are algae, and that is sort of, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's excreted, that's their waste. 
Right. But how, what's the best way to Yeah, have? that's a really good question. And I know yeah. there are areas that you shouldn't eat oysters from that are right. tested in DMF and, mm -hmm. you know, like the quality of the water and all that. But anyway, so yeah. I need a better response. Right. <laughs> so um, I guess there are good things that they're filtering and bad things that they're filtering. Right. So um, they're filtering plankton for the most part which there's nothing wrong with plankton, uh -huh. except that if you get too much plankton out there, then it can cause like algal blooms and stuff. Uh -huh. So they're taking the plankton in and they're in an ideal world, they're taking the plankton in and creating that protein food and there's nothing wrong with any of that. But if there are toxins, bacteria, contaminants, then they are gonna filter that too and they're gonna concentrate it. And that's why our food protection system is really okay. important. So if they're getting their oysters from an approved area, then the they're fine. They're yeah. fine. They're, they've been filtering plankton. Right. Um, they, they, there could be a little bit of water. sediment in there and things like that. Right. What you don't want is to be eating oysters from a contaminated right. area, an area like downstream of a wastewater treatment plant or just, you know, in someone's backyard because of stormwater going in and things like that. So, yeah, they're not, the oysters themselves are not very selective. They'll be like, <coughs> filter whatever's coming through. So we have to be careful about where yeah. we get them from. That helps. But they're able to clean the water and either of those scenarios. Either. Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yep. Well, that's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. The velvet diagram, you show the little brush looking thing on the right hand side above the foot. What's that? I think that is like the cilia. So they have a little, um, it's, <laughs> it's like a wing, I guess, that helps them move through the water, helps them swim. So little cilia that move, and then they actually lose that once they settle in the trochophore stage. Yeah. Yes? Is there a time of year that they that they, that they breed? Yep. Um, if mm -hmm. Storms come through during that time. Does it like yeah. push them into areas that they don't yes. necessarily need to be in? Yeah. So in North Carolina, they spawn um, basically from like March through November. We've seen them spawning outside of that time. Um, so an individual oyster might only spawn once during that time, but populations of oysters will be spawning pretty much continuously all through that time. So if there is a storm that comes through, yeah, probably those will be washed through. But actually one of the cool things that oysters will do is they'll compensate for that and they'll spawn again or they'll spawn extra. We actually saw that after Hurricane Florence. We had some equipment out in the, on Masonboro Island and the storm came through like a month of crazy gross fresh water that came from the river and everything. And then we went and back and looked at our spat tiles and there was just a huge amount of spat on those tiles. So they had, I think a lot of animals do this. They'll sense a stressor in the environment and they'll put a lot of energy into reproduction. Yeah. Yes, sir. We're hearing a lot from Florida like bathtub water or temperature or anything like that. Yeah. Is there a certain That's a good question too. They are pretty hardy, um, especially since our inner tidal oysters. I mean, imagine these oysters exposed, you know, for like four hours a day in the middle of summer out on our mud flats when it's like 95 degrees out there. Like they can do pretty well. They do have these proteins called heat shock proteins that help them cope with high temperatures. Um, and they provide some protective mechanisms for their DNA. Um, but I will say that when water temperatures are on average high, like they're not doing as well in the middle of July and August here as they are, like they, they're really happy this time of year. They love it when the water's in the 50s and the 60s. Um, they're eating a lot, they're consuming a lot, they're um, making, they're growing a lot. Um, so I think, you know, that could be a concern. That being said, there are tons of oysters in Florida. They do well in Florida. I don't think we really have to worry about it yet. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, kind of at the very beginning uh, changes in nitrogen in the water. Mm -hmm. What is it? What kind of human activity actually results in changes in nitrogen? Yeah. Farming. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of different kinds. So right. So there can be agriculture inputs of nitrogen. So fertilizers and then wastewater are the two that I looked at the most. So one of the concerns obviously with oysters like we're talking about is bacterial 
contamination. So one of the things I was actually working with the FDA to look at um, the paired nitrogen changes and also bacterial changes that you would detect in oysters compared to cleaner areas um, and you know how we could detect that. So, and you're not just looking at like one specific spot, but we're looking at the whole watershed and saying, has this whole watershed changed because of the nitrogen inputs that were coming into that particular watershed, which in that case, it was mostly wastewater and stormwater, but it depends where you are. Like here in the Cape Fear, we have different inputs. We have agriculture, we have you know, the hog lagoons, and as well as the wastewater inputs. So it kind of depends where you are. Yeah. All right. Um, I think they do, I think, are you talking about the biodegradable yeah, yeah. things? I think it is sort of like burlap. I don't know. It is a well, secret, right oh, or, yeah, the mesh, yeah. I mean, I think originally the idea was that they needed it to be, to be, have large enough holes that the oysters would settle in, you know, in the mesh. Um, but I think we're just more aware now of, you know, the impacts yeah. of plastic and... Yeah. I saw a demonstration, one of the, at Morris Landing once, mm -hmm. they showed um, the Coastal Federation, we were doing a cleanup, and showed, a, I don't know if it was burlap, but it was something like that, mm -hmm. lifted it up and everything fell out. It's not strong enough to hold. It does biodegrade probably too fast. Too fast in that way before you get into the yeah. water. But they yeah. are now not going to do any more plastic bags mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So, so we're, we're, coastal, but we're not going to use the plastic. Right. Remember yeah. That yesterday at Carolina Beach when we were looking at the oyster Yeah. To the problem with right. The and then having to go clean up the bags out. So that's yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. We're learning. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. If you did not sign in, there's a sign in sheet in the front um, room. If you could please sign your name, that'd be helpful. And if you have an extra moment and can help us stack chairs, we would love that too. Thank you, guys.